Funniest people in the world are usually the most self-deprecating. Like me, for example, I'm terrible. <laughs> and perhaps the connection between humor and humility has something to do with the second-class status of comedy in the arts and entertainment. Woody Allen famously said that when you write comedy, you're sitting at the children's table. But this is not the children's table. Mrs. Parker, uh, something of an overachiever herself in the area of self-deprecation, liked to say that the real literary giants of the 1920s were Hemingway and Dos Passos and Fitzgerald. You know, her point was that these guys weren't hanging out in a hotel in Manhattan insulting each other over lunch. But they were doing pretty much the same thing in Paris. And Ernest Hemingway, for all of his many gifts, was never once in his life funny on purpose. <laughs> and so, I think that this centennial and this uh, cathedral of criticism is the right time and place to take a stand and to assert that great comedy is great art, that laughter is profound and human and necessary, and that AB's Irish Rose is no worse than a bad cold. <laughs> the men and women who once had lunch at this table, or a table very much like it in this location, were deeply funny people, deeply funny. And the mystique of the round table has everything to do with humor, uh, but not just humor as a practice, humor as a lifestyle, humor as a language. They were in the right place at the right time. It was the time of the talkers. There was a very high premium in the 1920s on wit and wordplay and whimsy. Westbrook Pegler called it the era of wonderful nonsense. And he knew what he was talking about because his name was Westbrook Pegler. <laughs> the New York theater was still the centerpiece of American popular culture. And the members of the round table were overwhelmingly playwrights and theater critics and not performers. Uh, Tallulah Bankhead was an occasional member and Mr. Kaufman and especially Mr. Benchley later kind of stumbled into accidental success as performers. But there was only one core member of the round table and he's a semi-core member who was primarily a performer. He missed the first five years of lunches. He walked into this room for the first time in 1924. And in a circle of prodigious talkers, he was the silent type. But he and his brothers went on to become popular culture's foremost exponents of what I think of as the Algonquin school of American humor. In June of 1919, 100 years ago, at the time of that first Algonquin lunch, uh, there was an item that month in Billboard that said, uh, in their frantic search, that's how Billboard talked in 1919, in their frantic search for new material, producers of musical comedies seem to be overlooking the four Marx Brothers. The creativity of these boys could be well used in a review. But it would take another five years for that to happen. Another five years for them to get to Broadway and capture the attention of the Algonquin Round Table. Now the story of how the Marx Brothers triumphed over the depths of vaudevillian despair and clawed their way to New York in an unlikely masterpiece called I'll Say She Is, is a very good story. But I've told it so many times, and as I look out over your eager faces, I'm aware that I've told it to many of you, specifically, many times. I mean, Stuart, I don't have to tell you to buy my book. You've already sold it. So why don't we skip all the struggle and focus on the part of the story that resonates with the specific ghosts in this room. Let's begin on opening night, on the brilliant night of May 19th, 1924, when I'll Say She Is opens on Broadway at the Casino Theater. It's already been an epic, and by the time they get to the casino that night, the Marx Brothers have already done I'll Say She Is hundreds of times in dozens of cities. 
And some of the material is stuff that they've done thousands of times over their entire career in vaudeville, as nearby as the palace. But tonight is different because this is their Broadway debut. And all of the first string New York critics are in the audience, more than one of whom was in the habit of eating lunch right here. In fact, the Marx Brothers on that night were fairly innocent of the Algonquin Round Table. Um, they had hung out a little bit with Hecht and MacArthur in Chicago, and Groucho read the New York papers and knew who was who. But Harpo, who only read Variety, didn't particularly feel the weight of history on his shoulders on the night of May 19th, 1924. In fact, if we believe his memoir, he was in a bit of a mood. He was certain that I'll Say She Is would flop on Broadway, that as exciting as it felt right now, it was not going to last. And in his book, Harpo Speaks, he talks about sitting in his booth at Lindy's the afternoon of the day that I'll Say She Is opens on Broadway. This is Harpo speaking. I was back with my own people who spoke my language with my accent. Card players, horse players, bookies, song pluggers, agents, actors out of work, and actors playing the palace. Al Jolson with his mob of fans, Arnold Rothstein with his mob of runners and flunkies. The cheesecake was ambrosia. The talk was old familiar music. A lot of yucks, a lot of action, home sweet home. I got up to go to work with absolutely no enthusiasm. And I told the boys to save my seat. I took a cab down to the casino. The marquee lights had just been turned on. The four Marx Brothers in I'll Say She Is. I was not impressed. I was a realist. I kept hearing the words, sorry boys, you're shut. But what the hell, I thought, remembering the empty seat in Lindy's. It was going to be fun while it lasted. So this is the kind of thing that's going through Harpo's mind as he stands there on stage at the casino, silverware pouring out of his sleeve. <laughs> and all of these important critics are falling in love. By the time they get to the Napoleon scene, the revolution has already been won, and wonderful nonsense is the law of the land. Well, my queen, I'm off, and if I leave you here with them, I must be off. I wish you wouldn't open sardines with my sword. My infantry is beginning to smell like the Lenox Avenue local. Well, I'm off to make Russia safe for French pastry. I lost a swell chance to shoot one of those Russians. It was right near the gates of Moscow. If I find my sword, I must go and get him. <laughs> Kindly submit your complaints in writing. He offered to wait, but I'm getting disgusted with the whole war. If it rains tomorrow, I think I'll stay in bed. What are your plans, babe? Ah, the only thing that keeps me going is your devotion. It keeps me going and it keeps me coming back. It's women like you that make men like me like women like you. <laughs> I guess I said something that time. Ah, farewell, my queen, farewell. When I go to war, all of France is with me. And when I come home, all of France is with you. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't open sardines with my sword. Oh no, we had that, didn't we? Farewell, my queen, and if my laundry comes, send a general delivery care of Russia and count it. I was a sock short last week. You might sew on a button, hither and yon. Hither is not bad, but yon is terrible. Well, looks like I'm off again. The Russians are in full retreat, and I'm right in front of them. England rules the waves, but France waves the rules. Farewell, my queen. Caesar had his Brutus, Charles had Cromwell, and I've got rhythm. Whoopee! <laughs> And on May 20th, 1924, Manhattan wakes up with a severe Marx Brothers hangover, which among us has not been there at one time or another. These words of Mr. Benchley's are published in the humor magazine, Life. Benchley says, we are happy to announce that the laughing apparatus of this department, long suspected of being out of date and useless, is in perfect running order and can be heard any evening at the Casino Theater during those magnificent moments when the Marx Brothers are participating in I'll Say She Is. Not since sin laid its heavy hand on our spirit have we laughed so loud and so offensively. To watch Mr. Arthur Marx during the deluge of knives and forks from his coat sleeve 
or oh well at any moment during the show, is to feel a glow at being alive in the same generation. Wow. Alexander Wolcott, we are waiting in the wings for you. Wolcott's notice in the New York Sun is perhaps the most influential in establishing the Marx Brothers as a phenomenon. And uh, you know, Alec, always shy and reserved, not particularly forthcoming with his opinions about things. Wolcott um, made no secret of who his favorite Marx brother was. His review is headlined, Harpo Marx and some brothers. <laughs> and it's written with Alexander Wolcott's typical plain spoken humility. As one of the many who laughed immodestly throughout the greater part of the first performance, given by a new musical show titled, If Memory Serves, I'll Say She Is, <laughs> it behooves your correspondent to report the most comical moments vouchsafed to the first-nighters in a month of Mondays. It is a bright-colored and vehement setting for the goings-on of those talented cut-ups, the four Marx Brothers. In particular, it is a splendacious excuse for going to see that silent brother, that shy, unexpected, magnificent comic among the Marxes, who is recorded somewhere on a birth certificate as Arthur, but who is known to the adoring two a day as Harpo Marx. Harpo later tells Wilcott, it's the lousiest review I ever read. <laughs> Wilcott does have some praise for Groucho too. A crafty comedian with a rather fresher and more whimsical assortment of quips than is the lot of most refugees from vaudeville. And uh, as for the other brothers, he says Chico is more or less suppressed until the property man remembers to leave a piano on stage. And as for Zeppo, he is probably the property man. <laughs> Harpo is quite wary of Wolcott when they first encounter each other in person, backstage at the casino. Harpo is willing to humor an important critic, but he later remembered that during that whole conversation, uh, he just couldn't wait to get back to Lindy's, where nobody used words like behooves or splendacious. <laughs> but Harpo acclimates to Wolcott's company very quickly. Over the course of a long night playing poker, with the Thanatopsis Literary and Inside Straight Club. And now that Harpo that summer begins palling around with the literary set, a running gag begins to run through all of the New York papers all throughout that summer, characterizing Harpo as the brains of the Marx Brothers. <laughs> and Harpo played that role for all it was worth. He told the New York Review that the green hat by Michael Arlen was glittering but a trifle ostentatious. He tells the Evening Post, I read in my dressing room and my three brothers who are not studious like I am interrupt and try to keep me from being the brains of the Marx Brothers. <laughs> Groucho, having had just about enough of this, fires off a message to Wilcott for his column. There is no brains in the Marx family. <laughs> and if there was, it certainly wouldn't be Hoppo. He was seriously thinking of marrying his first grade teacher because they had been together for six years. <laughs> and then Chico joins in. Chico, who rarely delivers any first person testimony in the entire history of the Marx Brothers, takes the trouble to write a guest column for the Evening World in which he proclaims himself the only one of the four Marx brothers who is handsome. <laughs> I have the pulchritude. I mentioned that word to Brains Harpo and he thought it meant powdered sugar. <laughs> Certainly one of the most important roundtable connections and one of the most important figures in the Marx brothers' entire career is Algonquin Roundtable member George S. Kaufman. As soon as I'll say she's, ah, yes, a hand for Mr. Kaufman. <laughs> or as Groucho called him, Kaufman. Uh, Kaufman, as soon as I'll say she is opened on Broadway, it was just sort of understood that he was going to write for the Marx Brothers at some point. It was fate, it was preordained, and it was inevitable. It was Kaufman's destiny, and he couldn't escape it 
no matter how much he may have wanted to, when first approached, he supposedly said, I'd rather write for the Barbary Apes. <laughs> anyway, uh, Percy Hammond was a tough critic who had reviewed the Marx Brothers vaudeville act in Chicago. He'd written a very disparaging review. And um, Groucho was fond of a story about Hammond later during World War II. He was back in Chicago on the Tribune and there was an editorial meeting where they were talking about possibly sending Percy Hammond overseas to do some reporting. And Ring Lardner was there and Lardner said, now you can't do that, suppose he doesn't like the war. <laughs> so in the summer of 1924, Hammond is in New York and by this time he's become a big Marx Brothers fan and he seemed to understand that there was this cosmic connection between Kaufman and the brothers and all through that summer, he's sort of pushing them together. In his column in the Herald Tribune, Hammond sets up a sort of playful quarrel between Kaufman and Groucho. He writes that Kaufman, and he misspells Kaufman, two N's, he uses two N's on the end of Kaufman. Kaufman, he says, bears a strong resemblance to Julius H. Marx, the least beautiful of the Marx brothers. Kaufman takes the bait right away, and he writes into Hammond's column. Kaufman says, Sir, one of our elevator men has called my attention to your article in the Herald or the Tribune or something, in which you declare that Mr. Julius H. Marx, appearing in I'll Say She Is, looks like me, and in which you go even further and spell my name with two N's. Now, Mr. Hammond, I happen to be present also at the opening of I'll Say She Is, and I want to say that if you think Mr. Marx looks like me, then you are even crazier than I have always thought, and I would not like to have my good opinion of you disproved. In the first place, Mr. Marx is just a wee bit terrible looking. <laughs> and I have had some very favorable comments on my looks from time to time not even counting those from people who, it later turned out, were speaking of Mr. S.J. Kaufman. <laughs> also, Mr. Marx wears a black mustache. And you can appoint one person, and I will appoint one, and together they will appoint a third impartial one, and all together they can search high and low on me without finding a mustache of any color, far less black. Kaufman goes on to suggest that if Mr. Hammond is in any doubt about how my name is spelled, you could always go over to the Winter Garden, where it is in letters three feet high outside the building, whereas your name is not up there at all. <laughs> Mr. Hammond, spelled with three N's. Now it's Groucho's turn. He writes into Hammond's column. I'm not sure whether Kaufman has a mustache or not. Who can tell? Although some authors do find it advisable to wear something on the opening night. Another writer argues that Groucho doesn't look like Kaufman, he looks like Frank Tuttle. And the press driving home the point that he looks like Kaufman is really trying to distract us from his uncanny resemblance to Frank Tuttle. Hammond admits that the twin-like resemblance between Groucho and Kaufman may seem to be of little public consequence, but he still returns the next day with even more testimony from the pen of Groucho Marx. There came a day last week when I met Mr. Kaufman, my image, my counterpart, and I realized with a shudder that there was a resemblance. Not that I looked like him, but he did look a bit like me. <laughs> well, he had the same ripe lips and creamy complexion. What could we do? One face like ours was enough to burden an unhappy world and two would be intolerable. So we decided to amalgamate our faces and combine and retain the best features of both. We will never be able to launch a thousand ships, but with our merged face, we should be able to send one rowboat sailing away. <laughs> Kaufman, because he is conscripted by fate, writes the Marx Brothers next two shows, The Coconuts and Animal Crackers. He gets eternally linked with the Marx Brothers, and he also gets an $80 bathrobe. Yes, this is the tale 
that Joe Adamson in his immortal book about the Marx Brothers calls the Great Bathrobe Intrigue. This takes place during the run of Animal Crackers. Eight members of the cast and creative team, that's to say all four Marx Brothers, Kaufman, Maury Riskind, Kaufman's collaborator on the book, and the songwriters, Bert Kalmar and Harry Ruby, they all get together, they each chip in $10 to get a beautiful $80 bathrobe for the producer, Sam Harris, on his birthday. Beautiful, elegant bathrobe, lovely gift, enthusiastically received. And so a tradition was born, and every time one of their birthdays came around, the other eight would put in $10, get this lovely $80 bathrobe. And this was a lot of fun a few times. But as it kept going and the birthdays kept happening, interest began to flag a little bit. First of all, Chico was not always good for $10. A lot of times you wound up with $70 and an IOU from Chico. And then when Harpo's birthday came around, the other guys discovered that they could actually get a much nicer bathrobe at another store that only cost $72. So we could each just put in $9 instead of 10 and, and get something even nicer for Harpo. But when they explained that to him, Harpo said, nuts to that. And he insisted that they return the bathrobe and get a lesser one for $80 because it was the principle that mattered. Anyway, by the time it finally gets around to Harry Ruby, he's the last birthday in this cycle. Everyone else has gotten their bathrobe. And at this point, nobody's even talking about it. And Harry Ruby had reason to believe that perhaps he would not be receiving the bathrobe that by now he felt was practically his birthright. Harry Ruby's birthday uh, began to be anticipated with telegrams, letters, two weeks in advance, two weeks until Harry Ruby's birthday. Harry Ruby's birthday is in five days. So he felt he had driven the point home. And on his actual birthday, it was a matinee day, there were two shows that day, and he showed up at the theater just preening and pleased and knowing that despite all their joking, his friends were not gonna let him down. But the matinee came and went and there was no acknowledgement of Harry Ruby's birthday, certainly no $80 bathrobe. And after the matinee, Ruby was concerned enough to take the dramatic step of confronting Groucho in his dressing room. He went to see him. Groucho says, uh, oh, I think I know what this is about, Harry. Uh, it's about the bathrobe and your birthday. Listen, uh, last night the other fellas and I, we talked it over about getting you a bathrobe. And the thing is, everyone is for it except for me. Ruby says, what does that mean, everyone is for it except for you? You know, I've shelled out a lot of money so all you guys could have beautiful bathrobes. I want my bathrobe. I want what's coming to me. Groucho puts a hand on his shoulder very consolingly. I feel for you, Harry. I do. I sympathize. But I don't know what else to do about it. We talked it over at great length. And everyone is for it, except for me. <laughs> Harry Ruby storms out of the room. Now, as you probably know, there's a scene in Animal Crackers when Captain Spaulding, played by Groucho, presents a beautiful carved chest from Africa to Mrs. Rittenhouse, played by Margaret Dumont. He opens the chest and there are all these treasures from his travels inside. But at this performance, Groucho's there on stage, big Broadway audience out in the seats. Groucho opens the chest and out jumps Harry Ruby. <laughs> he gets right in Groucho's face and he says, where's my bathrobe? <laughs> and marches off into the wings. And it's the only time in recorded history that Groucho Marx was at a loss for words on stage. <laughs> I'll Say She Is plays its final Broadway performance on February 7th, 1925. And after the curtain call, Harpo leaves the casino theater on Broadway and 39th Street for the last time. And he comes here to the Algonquin Hotel. Harpo Marx, fresh from I'll Say She Is, comes right down this block, in that door, walks through that lobby, and right into this room. And this room is filled with all of his new friends. Wilcott, Kaufman, Parker, Benchley, Connolly, Brune, FPA, Nisa McMean, Jane Grant, and Harold Ross, all gathered here to celebrate 
the great success of the Marx Brothers, whose story in some ways is just beginning. You know, they still have two Broadway shows ahead of them, as well as 20 years of Marx Brothers movies. But these were the best of times. And to close this, I'd like to read a little something from the final chapter, for now, of my book, Give Me a Thrill. It picks up right here. Some of the friendships Harpo kindled around the round table would last a lifetime, enduring testament to the epical power of I'll Say She Is. Some of these stories would end in despair or tragedy, like the Jazz Age itself, which petered out into depression. And in the years ahead, the Marx Brothers would play an important role in making depression tolerable. But let's leave them here in 1925, sitting on a rainbow eating peaches and cream. Julius can't help but smile, smug and self-satisfied as he wipes away the grease paint with cold cream. Leonard and Herbert are itching to strike out into the electric New York night in pursuit of their own favorite kinds of action. Arthur is at the Algonquin and life is but a dream. As the silent partner remembered decades later, when I shook hands with FPA, he said nothing, but a hotel knife dropped out of his sleeve and clattered onto the floor. <laughs> and I think that was the exact moment I knew, without any reservations, that I belonged to the world of Wolcott and his friends, and to no other. I never did get back to Lindy's. Thank you.